All righty, I want to welcome everybody at the 288 campus, Friendswood campus, Alvin campus, Webster campus, and Pearland campus. I'm going to tell you something, what a great weekend we had last week on Easter weekend. It was absolutely over the top, amazing, and uh, I, I, I said, yeah, praise the Lord for that. I said something in the very last service last weekend, but I want to say it again in every service this weekend so that everybody has a chance to encourage this group of people that I want to talk about for just a moment. I, I want to say thank you to our volunteers. Our volunteers helped us to, to have 30 services across our five campuses last week, 30 services last weekend. Give it up for our volunteers. You guys are the best. <laughs> Absolutely amazing. And because of you volunteers and those 30 services, last weekend we had more people come to church on a weekend than we've ever had in the history of our church. It was over the top amazing. And, and uh, in addition to that, uh, we launched our Pearland campus last weekend. And, yeah, and get this, last weekend at Pearland, they had over 1,300 people in the grand opening services last week. Way to go, Pearland. <laughs> Woo! <clears throat> and and uh, I'm not done yet. A, mass, a massive thank you to uh, everyone who's given, everyone who's invited someone to come with you. You know, that's what we're all about. That's the heart of our church is to make Christ known. You guys get it. I'm so honored to be able to do life and to do church with you. So God bless you. Today, we're going to do this. We're going to begin this series called Act Like Men. And uh, question as we begin, it's an important one. Did you get a bacon donut? Did you get a bacon? <clears throat> amen, amen. If you did not get a bacon donut, please do not uh, dismay, I ate one for you. So <laughs> we're all good. We're squared away there. But um, here's the deal. If, you, if you're paying attention to what's happening in our culture right now, and you should pay at least some attention, especially if you have young kids at your house. But if you are paying attention, then you know that in these past few years, there's been basically an avalanche of anti-traditional family rhetoric and propaganda that seeks to erase gender norms that uh, is creating ambiguity and confusion. Uh, biblical values are under assault like never before. And <clears throat> the world, I think, has become a very confusing place, especially maybe for our young people who aren't, uh, you know, haven't had time to be grounded in the truth yet. <clears throat> but um, for those of us who are grounded in, in the truth and, and, uh, and for this church family, they're there's no confusion. There's zero confusion. And I say that because we believe the Bible at this church. We believe the Bible. And uh, we believe what Jesus said in John chapter 10, or Mark chapter 10, when he said this. From the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. So Jesus says, uh, male and female is the way it is. It's the way that it has always been since creation. That's how God established it. But we've arrived at a point where this very basic truth of human existence, male and female, which has never been in doubt <clears throat> ever in history, is now being obliterated as even uh, once respected medical journals now bow their knee to the false god of the age and can't even define what a woman is. We got here after years of shaming men. Any, any strong man had... Had, has become a target uh, because, because he's considered part of the problem. He's part of the patriarchy. He's part of the old, outdated, cisgender, binary norms. And unfortunately, some Christians have even bought into this, which is disastrous because this is an ideology straight out of hell. And I say it's, it's straight out of hell because... <clears throat> I'm saying it's straight out of hell today because this ideology is all about destruction. And Jesus once upon a time said this in John chapter 10. He's talking about the devil. He says, the thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. So the choice right here is very clear. It's choose Jesus and choose life or choose the wide road that the world is on, which leads to destruction. And that's what the devil wants for all of us. And that's what this gender 
eliminating ideology does. It destroys what God has created. It destroys men. It destroys women. In fact, it's erasing women right now. If you, I don't know if Google will be honest with you, but <clears throat> if you search, you know, like uh, uh, women of the year in certain categories, more and more females are being replaced with males acting like women. Whether it's uh, the lawmaker of the year or, or, uh, or, or uh, swimmer of the year or whatever else. You just do a search actress, female actress. Uh, it's, you know, it's on and on it goes. And so it's destroying men. It's eliminating, erasing women. It's uh, hurting families and it's destroying children. Men have long been the target. But let me tell you something. Men are not the goal. The ultimate goal of the evil one is to get the children. But to get the kids, you got to take out the men. And that's why we're embarking on this four-week series. Never before, <clears throat> at least in my lifetime, have we needed the men of God to step up like we do right now. Now, the title of our series comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 16, where it says this. Be watchful, stand firm in the faith. Read this with me. Act like men. Be strong, let all that you do be done in love. So <clears throat> this is the English standard version that we use each and every week at our church. Sometimes we'll add in another uh, translation, but we use this one typically every week and at our church now. And if you have a different Bible translation, you may not see the phrase act like men. I need to explain that to you. The Greek word that is translated act like men into English is, is the word andridzomai. Andridzomai, that's a Greek word. It's translated, act like men. Uh, this is the only time that it's used in the entire New Testament. In other translations uh, of the Bible, it's translated as be courageous. But even then, it's masculine. So, it, and, and all these phrases, by the way, are military terms in, in verse 13. So it, even, though it's, uh, even though it just says be courageous in some translations, the implied meaning is to be courageous as a man should be. Andridzomai, andridzomai. To show oneself a man and to be courageous like a man should be. That's a definition. So through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul challenges men to assume their God-given responsibilities to act like men. So how do we act like men? And I, I ask the question because right now so many people are telling men what to do and how to act and how they shouldn't act. And the voices are loud nowadays. And it's like, you know, a lot of them are saying, step back, shut up, and sit down. You know, we don't need to hear from men anymore. And lots of opinions, how to act like a proper man nowadays. But what we're going to do is we're going to go right here. We're going to go right here. And in the Bible, in these two verses that we read from 1 Corinthians chapter 16, God tells men what he expects from them. In fact, surrounding the phrase, act like men, are two other phrases on either side, two on this side, two on this side. So act like men is in the middle. And so the way I'm looking at it is this. You've got to act like men in the middle. And then around that phrase, God tells us how to act like men, what he expects from us. So the way I'm seeing it is act like men is the hub. And then we have spokes coming off of the hub uh, as is gloriously illustrated in this picture right here. <clears throat> and it is, it is glorious. And all the men said, amen. amen. It is beautiful. It's a beautiful thing. And if you don't know, it's 1970 uh, Chevelle Super Sport and this one 454 motor in it. But that's beside the point. Here's the, <laughs> here's the wheel. <clears throat> and it's a four spoke wheel, which is unusual because it's a five lug wheel, but it can be done. But I'm making a point here. Paul says, act like men. Okay, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul writes, act like men. And then around it, he puts four phrases that show us how to act like men. So if you were to see that verse on this wheel, it, okay, here's, here's the verse again. Be watchful, stand firm in the faith. There's the two things. Act like men in the middle. Be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. Here it is. Act like men. Be watchful. Stand firm in the faith, be strong, let all that you do be done in love. 
God inspires the Apostle Paul to show us what he expects us when he tells us that we need to act like men. We have these four spokes, four spokes to help us be balanced as men, okay? So the first one we're going to talk about this week is this one right here, be watchful. Again, this is a military term. And the definition of this word from the original language is this, to take heed lest through remission, which would be like a lowering of alertness, and indolence, which would be like apathy or laziness, some destructive calamity suddenly overtake you. So God is telling men, you, you need to stay alert. You need to be watchful and stay alert. Now, this was easy for people to understand back in Bible times because back in Bible times, cities of any consequence had a wall around them to protect the city, and the walls worked. They worked. And uh, every night what would happen would be that the city would close the gates so that no one could enter or exit. So everybody would be closed in at night. Uh, enemies uh, would be on the outside, hopefully. And uh, then they would post watchmen along the wall. The watchmen were doing two things. One, they were looking outside the city to make sure that no enemy was attacking, but they could also turn around and look inside of the city to alert people on the inside, including their families, what was going on. So they could inform and direct the people on the inside, and they could watch for enemy attack on the outside. So if the wall was being breached, obviously, they could send out the alert to let them know. Now, here's a picture of the wall around the old city of Jerusalem. This is a, a present-day picture, but <clears throat> probably, I'm going to say it looked a lot like that back in Bible times. And if you go to the Old Testament book of Nehemiah, there's a story of the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. And uh, back when Nehemiah was around, this is at the end of the Babylonian exile. And so uh, the children of Israel are making their way back to the promised land slowly, coming back from the exile. But the city, Jerusalem, was in ruins. The walls were broken down. city was in ruins. So God put it on Nehemiah's heart to get the wall rebuilt so that the city could be revitalized once again. They're working on the wall then. They're working hard. They're making lots of progress. But the wall wasn't done yet when word came to Nehemiah that the enemy was preparing an attack. That's bad news because there was lots of places that the enemy could breach the wall. And so what happened at that point was Nehemiah posted men on the wall to watch. But what he did, the way he did it was brilliant because he posted men on the wall near their own homes. So he's like, where do you live? Right there. Get on the wall right here. Because he knew that if they were close to their homes, that they would for sure keep watch because it meant their own family's protection. And then he said this, do not be afraid of the enemy. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, fight for your sons, fight for your daughters, fight for your wives and fight for your homes. Now, how many of you know that that night, not one man fell asleep on the wall? Why? Because when it's your job to stand watch on the wall next to your family, you're going to remain watchful. And that's exactly the idea that God is giving us in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 when he says, act like men and be watchful. Be watchful. So what are we watching for? Well, this is a two-pronged approach once again. There's two things that we're doing. If you're a man and you're supposed to be standing on the wall keeping watch, you're looking out for enemy attack, but then you're also looking back at your family to make sure that they're okay, that they're not falling for something, okay? So we're going to take these one at a time. First of all, you're looking out and you're knowing if the culture is having any influence on your family. That's the enemy attack, okay? If I called you up in the middle of the night and I say, hey, 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 you got issues, man. Somebody's going to be breaking into your house tonight. Or, or if I called you up in the middle of the night and said, right now, right now, somebody's trying to get into your daughter's room or your son's room. I know something about every single man in this church. You would take care of business. Amen? You would take care of business. Well, I'm telling you right now, the enemy's after your kids. The enemy's after your kids. 
And for some of us, maybe the enemy has breached the walls of our homes and our kids are in danger right now. And I say that because some of our kids are being bombarded with content that is confusing them, that is stealing their innocence, that is destroying the way that they think about themselves in healthy ways and about others as well. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples and both heartbreaking. Here's the first one. The average age of first exposure to pornography is 9.66 years old for girls, 9.95 years old for boys. That's the average, which means for some it's much lower. Now, it used to be that if a guy wanted to get his hands on pornographic material, he'd have to go to the seedy side of town to the dimly lit shop and rob and get whatever he was looking for. But now your kids can get it on their phone, in your home. And what's horrible about this is you put your kids to bed, you pray with them, tell them a good night story, tuck them in, give them a little kiss on the forehead, walk out of the room thinking that they're protected and then they reach to their nightstand or wherever they keep their phone and pick it up and the enemy breaches the walls of your home. Pornography it messes people up. I don't need to tell some of you that because you know it. But it severely damages the way that we see ourselves, the way that we see other people, it hurts our relationships. And kids are being targeted. Men, protect your children. If they're young, I'd take away their phone. Maybe not, maybe not 100% of the time, but like if they want to play a game or something, but don't let them have a phone when they're not in your presence. Or maybe, or in addition to that, put a filter, put an app on their phone that's a filter for their phone. And on our digital listening guide today that you can get by scanning the QR code on the seat back in front of you, we have um, a link to Covenant Eyes, which has great resources for your computer. You can put a, a filter on your own computer or your kid's computer, or you can put an app on your phone or their phones, and it just helps. It's an extra layer of protection. Listen, times are changing, man. It's different than when you were a kid. In fact, it's different than it was three years ago. I'm just saying, there are evil people who want to make filth available for your kids to see, and they're doing it on purpose. Repair the breach in the wall and be watchful. Same would apply to, you know, TV and music. Keep watch. Keep watch. And if your kids are teenagers, if your kids are teenagers, first of all, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, secondly, <laughs> prayer partners will be available at the end of the service. <laughs> but if your kids are teenagers, I would highly suggest, and this is going to be controversial, but let's just go with it. I would highly suggest look at their phone. Look at their phone. If they live under your roof, it's not only, and you're paying the bills, it's not only your right, it's your responsibility. And maybe somebody is pushing back on that right now because you're like, oh, I don't know, I don't know, because they're gonna get, a, they're gonna get mad at me, they're gonna be angry with me. Good. <laughs> you're not a parent until your kids get mad at you. <laughs> up, up until then, you're just their buddy, okay? And they don't need any more buddies. They need a parent to show them the way. Amen? L listen, if they, if they were standing in your kitchen and, and they had a group of people with them that you didn't know about and like scantily dressed or weird or whatever, and, and they were saying things and using language that goes against your values and your morals and what you know the Bible wants for your kids, what God wants for your kids, you would kick those people out of your house in a heartbeat. You'd kick them out. Well, those people can now show up on a daily basis in your house, and you won't even know it unless you look, unless you look. So what are you looking for when you get their phone? Anything you want. Anything you want. 
But for starters, if they have social media apps, I would, I would go to those apps and see two things. Number one, or letter A, see how much time they are spending on each social media app per day. And if it's too much, set a time limit. You can do that, okay? Listen to this. The average TikTok user opens TikTok 19 times a day and spends 95 minutes a day on that app. 95 minutes a day, that's 20, 26 hours a month. So just over a day every month, which equates to 2.3 years on the app in your lifetime. 2.3 years. Now imagine that it's about time for you to go to heaven and you're on your deathbed and you're thinking back to, over your life. What did I do with my life? <laughs> and then you recall that you spent 2.3 years going <laughs> oh, talk about a monumental waste of a life. Amen. Am I preaching to the adults right now? <laughs> and I wish it was just a monumental waste of time for our kids. I wish it was. But I think for some of our kids, it's more nefarious than that, more evil than that. And this is where the enemy can breach your wall without you knowing it. So secondly, with their phone in your hand, scroll through the post each social media app is suggesting. See what the social media app is trying to get them to look at. And it, it could be because of, you know, the algorithm that's set for them because of uh, posts that they've interacted with. It could be just trending topics that the social media app wants to hook them on. But I'm going to warn you right now that the uh, alphabet agenda, I'm talking about LGBTQ agenda, and especially the trans movement is making a full court press for the kids. Now, it's everywhere. I don't know if you know that. Every cartoon, basically. I mean, I watched Peppa Pig with my little man, you know, James, two years old. And they went that direction. Peppa, Peppa, Peppa Pig. <laughs> Come on. Build-A-Bear last week came out with a drag queen bear. A male bear with dressed like a female uh, with she, her pronouns. build a bear. Lego last week introduced the ABCs. They have a kit for every letter having to do with some alternative lifestyle other than what the Bible suggests and tells us to have. It's everywhere. By the way, Washington passed a law, state of Washington passed a law in the past couple of days that children can legally be taken away from their kids if the parent does not agree to gender of affirming is what they call gender affirming care for that child. Like their child wants to be a different gender, but the parents don't want it. The kids can legally be taken away in the state of Washington. What in the world? So here we are. What do we do? Men, your job is to act like a man and be watchful. But how can you watch if you won't even look? You got to look. And when your child says, wait, 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 <laughs> get, you know, because they'll get nervous. What's the big deal? What's the big deal? What's the big deal? You tell them, you're the big deal. You're the big deal. Because the kids are the prize in this spiritual battle. They're the prize. Tell them you're the big deal. And, and honestly, parents, we can't stop all of the attacks that they're going to have. But making an effort shows our children where we stand. And it opens up the door for a conversation so that we can speak truth into their lives on these subjects, which is kind of the second point here. <clears throat> Help your child, your family understand their identity in Jesus. <clears throat> so we're looking out for enemy attacks, but we're also looking back. And we're helping our family to understand how God made them. <clears throat> Now, the alphabet ideology preys on vulnerable kids 
that don't feel like they fit in, that don't feel like they're pretty enough, that don't feel like they're athletic enough, that don't like their own body, which every kid feels these ways at some time or another. But there's been a massive uptick in the percentage of kids who are now being diagnosed with gender dysphoria, meaning you feel like you're in this wrong body for your sex, which you, your, you know, mental thing. Your body's not what it should be. In fact, I think it was two years ago, kids being diagnosed with gender dysphoria increased 70% over one year. 70%. That, and also, there's an uptick in kids identifying as trans or non-binary. This, my friends, is the definition of a social contagion. A social contagion. Here's what that is. Behavior, emotions, or conditions spreading spontaneously through a group or network. That's what ha- what's, this is what's happening to the kids right now. You've got young kids whose bodies are changing or not who are slightly depressed or not, who have a low self-esteem, which every kid struggles with at some time or another. But because of this flood of social media posts, TV shows, corporations, politicians, celebrating any young person that rejects the truth of the Bible and comes out as something else, because of that affirming and celebration, more kids are buying into the lie. And it is a lie. Now, for a time, it feels like the truth because when, when, when a kid comes out, they get so much support, so much affirmation. Uh, they post, you know, on, on, online what they're thinking about or what they're going to do. Or, and people just flood them with affirmation, liking their posts, sharing their posts, telling them that they're brave and amazing. And if it's a young man putting on makeup, they're like, you're beautiful, you're beautiful. But you listen to the people who've gone down this road, and at the beginning they say it is euphoric, it is euphoric. So much support, so much love, so much popularity that comes along with it. But it doesn't last. It doesn't last. I I watched a clip on YouTube. of a show that I've never seen, and I'm not going to see it in case you're wondering, but it's a show called I Am Jazz. And the clip that I saw, if you don't know what that is, it's a show about a young man, a young man who's trying to live like a girl. And uh, he's had all the surgeries, but in the clip that I saw, he's literally confessing to his mom with tears in his eyes. You can tell the kid is desperate. And he tells her, he says, I just want to feel like myself. I just want to be happy and feel like me, but I don't feel like me ever. And then his mom chimed in, true story here. She chimes in, she says, you're just being negative. You're your own worst enemy. You're getting in your own head. Uh, Quit thinking about this so much. And I knew right then that mom was the problem. In another clip, They showed his mom sitting at dinner or lunch outside with two other moms who I assume were moms of trans kids as well. And this young man's mom says, I go into his room every day and I tell him, and I don't know how graphic I can get here, but just just think, okay, because I know we got kids in the room, but he's had all the male stuff taken, and, and they turned things around and tried to make him in surgically into a female, so figured that out. And because of that, every day he has to be dilated, every day, so it doesn't grow back. And so his mom says, I go into his room every day, and I tell him, you got to do this today, you got to do this today, and he's in bed, and you can tell the kid's depressed, he's like, I don't feel like it, I don't feel like it, I don't want to, I don't want to. And in this clip that I saw with the mom and the two other moms, she says, so I tell him, you better do this or I'm going to come in there and do it for you. That's child abuse. That's child abuse. And one of the other moms said at that point in the clip, you have to force them because if you don't, 
that have slipped back into their old ways. And I felt so sorry for that kid. So sorry for him. Lord, save him. And use him for your glory, God. The statistics are grim. 10 to 15 years after surgical reassignment, the suicide rate of those who have undergone sex reassignment surgery rose to 20 times that of comparable peers. So 20 times people your same age. And why? Well, certainly not because people aren't celebrating this lifestyle enough. It's because, and I want you to hear me on this, a person is never going to find true fulfillment apart from a relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. That's the bottom line right there. And if, our, and if our identity is anywhere, anywhere other than Christ, like if it's in our looks or it's in our athletic ability or our sex or our race or how many likes we're getting on social media and the affirmation we get from other people or if it's if our if our identity is in what kind of car we drive or what kind of home we live in or how much money we make we are headed toward a brick wall because those things are going to let us down eventually only when we have our identity in Jesus and are walking with him can we truly find joy fulfillment and satisfaction in this life And men, men, if you, if, if you want to be, if you want to get this right, you got to be watchful over your family, over your kids, over your grandkids if you're blessed to have them in your life. We need to let them know, we need to let them know that when God made them, he did not make a mistake. He did not make a mistake. Um, you know, this is a little boy. We need to do our best with God's help to raise them to be a godly man. If it's a little girl, we need to raise her to be a godly woman for the glory of her creator. We need to let them know that they are a masterpiece created anew in Christ Jesus to do good things. You look at this verse, there's identity there, there's relationship, there's purpose there. And can you imagine... If that young man that I had on the screen earlier, if when he started having doubts about how he was made, if his mom would have shared that verse with him instead of encouraging him in the wrong direction. Now, I believe that same-sex attraction is real. I believe that a person can be dissatisfied with their body. <clears throat> but we do no one any favors when we encourage them away from their God-given identity. When we encourage them away from God's plan, when we affirm them, when we fly their flag on our profile, or when we like their posts when they're flaunting their sinful lifestyle, or by using the pronouns that don't match the person that God made them to be. Listen, affirming someone away from God and his will is sin. It's sin. Author Laura Perry Smoltz, she says she wasted nine years of her life living as, um, or trying to live as a man. She calls it a false identity, trying to be a man. She has since detransitioned and is a Christ follower and author. She said this in an interview, this is what came out. When the Lord enlivened her heart and mind with the gospel, she returned to the church of her youth and her conservative Christian parents. Her church and parents had refused to use her preferred pronouns throughout all the years she lived in the false identity of transgenderism. Why did she return to them? She said, their refusal to lie compelled her to trust. The most loving thing that you can do for someone is, with, is in love to tell them the truth and tell them who they are, and who they can be in Jesus Christ. I'm just telling you today, men, if your people, if your people heard this from you, what a difference that would make in their lives. The devil, the devil wants you to be silent. The devil wants to render you men ineffective so that he can destroy your family. But Jesus wants you to be strong. 
and, and let me tell you why. I've shared this stat before. I'll probably share it again before this series is over. But in the book uh, by David Morrow, uh, Why Men Hate Church, he, he has this quote, this statistic, and it is this. When a man comes to faith in Christ, the rest of the family follows over 90% of the time. So when a man comes to Christ, the rest of the family follows over 90% of the time. When a mom comes to faith in Christ, the rest of the family follows only 17% of the time. I don't know how or why God gave men that kind of influence. I don't know why it works that way, but it does work that way. Which means, men, you have incredible influence on your family. And if you can impress things like this upon them, they may go sow their wild oats, and a lot of kids do, but imagine hearing in the back of their minds their father's voice telling them that they're a masterpiece. That God didn't make a mistake when he made them. And then ultimately them coming back to that. So men, you have influence, use it for the glory of God. Men, get on the wall. Get on the wall and keep watch. Amen. Why don't you stand with me, please? Now, today, if you don't know Christ, I'm just telling you, you can be made anew. Just like that verse we read in Ephesians, you could be made anew in Christ Jesus. And because what he did for you on the cross of Calvary. You can leave with your sins forgiven. You can leave with purpose, joy, and satisfaction that you can have throughout all eternity. Prayer partners will be down front. Come down and see them, or if you need prayer for anything today, come on down. Let's bow. Heavenly Father, thank you for your grace and mercy and love, Lord. I pray that uh, the words that have been spoken today would fall on fertile soil in the hearts of our people. I know, Lord, that there's probably some who are struggling as they're right in the middle of all this. Lord, help them. Help them to find a solid foundation in your word, Lord. I pray that for those who don't know you today, that they would get to know you, that they would surrender their lives today so that you can do something awesome in them. Watch over us as we go. Bring us back again. I pray all this in your son's name and all the people said. Amen. God bless, guys. We'll see you next time.